So um, that, was, that was pretty fun, right? So again, we saw some basics in the beginning when you get your, your, your when, when we got started. We then saw how, you, how quickly you can get up and running with your app on AWS. And we now saw how easy it was. And it, uh, we timed it 15 minutes, you know, go global and scale up. Now, what we were saying earlier on is that at some stage you want to make money as well as a startup. And you want to obviously want to think about that from day one. But as you scale further, um, you want to make sure you, you pay some more attention to that. So, so no demos now. Let's quickly some key concepts that we'll talk about. Uh, when I see pitch decks from startups, so I often introduce startups to, to, to certain VCs. And when I do that, I tend to see their pitch deck first. And what you always see is this beautiful hockey stick. Like my business is going to do this. My revenue will go like crazy, or my usage will go through the roof, or downloads, or clicks, or whatever. Unfortunately, what you often see is, even if that were to happen, that costs are going up like that as well. So you still will not make a lot of money. So at that stage, as a startup, you only want three things, right? You want your revenue to go up. You want your unit cost to go down. And you want your margin to go up. So something like this. The hockey stick goes like that. Incremental. Your costs are dec you know, decremental, if that's the way of saying it. So how does AWS he help here? Obviously, we spoke about economies of scale earlier on. Um, Kingsley Wood talked about different pricing models. Right? So I won't go into that. I will go into cost aware architecting. And before we do that, let's review some of these pricing things. You know that you pay as you go. Um, you pay less when you use more, specifically with things like S3. Um, Kingsley explained reserved instances, and, and you pay less when you reserve. What we're going to talk about right now is pay even less when you architect for cost optimization. And, and let's think first about what that looks like in reality. So these are all concepts. It's all nice. It's all like, yeah, we, we reduce our cost, and you can architect smartly. But how do these things come together and help customers in reality? So let's look at one example. So this is an enterprise software provider. Started in India, but with customers globally right now. Focus on software as a service for storage, security, collaboration, backed by one of the leading global venture capital firms. And they've always been like growing strongly, but they've always been focused on cost as well. And they work very closely with our team. Now, when you look at it, at the top right, you see it's based on a true story. We obviously don't disclose like detailed customer data. We don't have a full view on their, on their revenue. We know it's been growing. We don't know it grew as linear as this. What we do know is their cost. And what you see there is it's not a linear line, but it's more like a sawtooth. How did that happen? This is 2012. In the beginning of 2012, we dropped our pricing of S3 by 10%. So this is your economies of skill, passing that on to you guys as cost savings. Then we worked with our team to reduce the cost of their EC2 instances by getting an RI purchase. And we helped them to analyze um, for which instances it makes sense, how much of them, what type of RI would make sense, and so on. Then we helped their team um, to move to DynamoDB, again, saving significant cost. And then towards the end of the year, we dropped the pricing of S3 again, right? So it now starts looking really similar to what I just showed. Your revenue is going up, but your costs are going down. And that basically means that your margin is growing, right? That's what you want. You want to make money at some stage. If you take all these things together and you look at the normalized unit cost of what happened here is a very, very significant um, reduction in their overall cost by leveraging all these things and how they come together. So again, we're now at the final stage of this startup journey. We're now at the scale of getting from scale to profitability. I won't talk about the commercial models. Again, that has been done before today. But I'll zoom into cost aware architecting um, and then briefly touch upon a case study of Pinterest, a very uh, fast growing and successful startup in the States. So, when we look at cost aware architecting, uh, I like to quote Werner Vogels, who um, I don't think it was here in Bangalore, but it was somewhere else where he spoke on stage and where he said the following um, Obviously, he's an engineer, right? And engineers are focused on, on building great, highly available, secure apps and software and so on. They, they don't always think consciously about cost. So, you know, show me a number of, of fault-tolerant applications, uh, sorry, algorithms, and I can pick the, the best one with my eyes closed. 
but ask me what makes most sense for the business. And that's a lot harder. So one of the things we're saying, and what uh, Shekhar was saying from Excel as well, is we help to come in with our solution architects to help you think about costs and actually help you reduce those costs. So when we do that, there's a couple of things we can, we can do. Um, there's a lot of things we can do, and these are basic, very simple, standard things we can do. There's different ways to reduce the cost of your compute. There's different ways to reduce the cost of your storage, of your database, and of your test dev. So let's zoom into some of those. And we go back to some of the architectures that by now are familiar, because throughout this session, we've been touching upon and we've been building this architecture, right? So the first one is caching and offloading, right? I mentioned that earlier on, that how important it is that when you scale, that you actually start not having your, ins your, your static files on your EC2 instances, but you put them in S3. Now, I mentioned how important that was from a scaling point of view, but it's also very important from a cost point of view. Let's say that you have this architecture running, and in both availability zones, you have three EC2 instances running. Now, I put S3 in front of that, and I put CloudFront in front of that. What happens right now is that a lot of calls, a lot of APIs calls or customer calls, no longer hit your EC2 instances, but are taken care of by CloudFront and your S3 buckets. We've got auto-scaling, so as soon as less traffic actually hits your web servers, you'll scale down. And we've seen instances where people uh, were serving uh, their web app and needed about 30 instances to, to support uh, the traffic. They did this, and suddenly, they could scale down to six EC2 instances. There's a big cost impact of that. S3 and CloudFront, if you think about it, are way, uh, will cost you way less than those tw 24 EC2 instances that in this particular case they could shut down. So you save costs by doing that. And your architecture is better and more redundant and your user experience is better. So the knife cuts both ways. Um, an example of that is a company in Singapore that's doing a, a loyalty app. It's called Perks. Um, I'm not sure how often you have it here in India. We actually have it here with the, with the passports, right? You, you get a chop, and if you got six chops, you can win something, or you get the next coffee for free. Now, people started walking around with 10 different um, uh, cards for each of the different stores, and these guys have turned that into an app. So you see that, on the one hand, you have all these restaurants that are part of this app and where you can actually use it. Now, all the logos there are obviously static content. So as soon as they started, caching and offloading that, again, using S3 and CloudFront, the user experience got improved significantly. And again, they could reduce their cost as well. And they didn't just do that with their static content. They also did that with their um, dynamic content, where on the other side of the screen, you see uh, the less th those, those logos are very static. But they would also do like daily deals or weekly deals or content that changes a lot. Even that could be, um, could be cached and offloaded. So a second way to reduce cost is by load balancing from the start. Again, I often get this, this question from startups, like, hey, yeah, Peter, we were, we're, we're running on a physical box right now, and we'd love to move to AWS. Let's do that when we start scaling. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? Well, it's clear what my answer is going to be, but, but what I always try and do to explain that is, is, is what I say is, let, let's say that you go into an airplane, and you go into the runway, and at some stage you start taking off. Is it a good idea to start changing the engine just when you start taking off? It's very risky. It's not a good thing to do. You want to get on that runway and be there with the right engine. Because as soon as you start taking off, it's literally all hands on deck. Everyone is at the dashboards making sure everything goes right. So you don't want to be unprepared for that skill. So even initially when you have one instance, get your load balancer there so that you don't have to like uh, repoint um, your DNS, for example, to uh, other EC2 instances, but make sure that you do it from day one. And how that's going to impact from a cost point of view is as soon as you start doing that and you start creating auto scaling groups on it, that will allow you to start getting the benefits from auto scaling. So if you look at that, let's, let's look at auto scaling and let's look at auto scaling. Oh, sorry, guys. Let's look at what we call auto scaling done right and, and look at an example here. So. Um, I think the largest newspaper in India is Times of India, right? Now, in Singapore, we have one thing that's called the Straits Times. And all their mobile assets run on Amazon Web Services. Um, so their iPhone app, their, um, their iPad app, and so on. And it's managed by a, a partner of us called Buke. It's a mobile developer. Now, 
I'm not sure if you have a smartphone and you have the app from, from the uh, Times of India or any other newspaper, but what you sometimes get is this breaking news alert, right? Something big happened and they send you a quick notification. Now think about what happens when they send out a notification like that. What will people do? They'll click it and suddenly everyone will come. So Bug knows that and, this, and, and Singapore Times know, knows that or Straits Times knows that. So what they do is they have an elastic load balancer. They set up auto scaling, but not based on CPU workload, but based on events. So call it event driven auto scaling. As soon as the notification comes from the Straits Times, the system will basically hold that for a bit, but automatically start spinning up EC2 instances. Once they're up, they pass on the notification to the end users. Then they come, but now we're fully prepared. Our EC2 instances are up and running. We have additional capacity. We can deal with that load. And the important thing is they know that people click within the first hour or they don't click. So what they do after 59 minutes, they scale it down and they only pay for that single hour of additional resources. So let's look at what that looks like. You got your straights times here at the right at the bottom. You got the buke and the system there. A notification is sent to the notification server that you see in the middle. As soon as the notification comes, auto scaling kicks in and it increases the number of EC2 instances. Then the notification goes to the users and then when all the users come, they're ready and they're prepared. Right? Pretty powerful. Now we spoke quite a bit about S3. Um, what's interesting is that there's not a lot of people aware of a specific version of that that we, that we call reduced redundancy. So S3 has this famous 11 nines of durability, right? 99.999 is very, very, very durable. There are a lot of files, however, where you have the source file and you create a lot of derivative files. So in case you would lose a file, it's, it's, it's bad, but it's not that bad because you can always regenerate it from the source file. And you see that a lot where you might have a source file, but you need a specific version of that for your iPad app or for a desktop or for a Mac or whatever. So rather than have all of that in S3, you can say I have my origin file or my source file um, in S3, and I use S3 reduced redundancy, which has four nines of durability, 99.99%, which is still much more durable than many of the external hard disks that you will ever have. Um, but it's 33% cheaper, roughly, than, than S3. And you can classify entire buckets as reduced redundancy, do that based on APIs, whatever. Um, it's a very, very simple way to start thinking about what are my static assets, um, what is the importance of those, can they be regenerated, and if so, use reduced redundancy. Um, here's just a version. We've seen it before where you have your, 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 your DNS, you have your, uh, your servers, and then CloudFront and your S3 behind it with different buckets. And as mentioned, some of those could be reduced redundancies, whereas others could be in the normal ones. Now, let's start looking at the cost of your database. Um, as I think Werner mentioned this morning, very often the database is a bottleneck for fast-growing businesses. Managing them well is very important. We talked about RDS. We talked about DynamoDB. Um, what often happens, and I actually spoke with a CTO of one of the uh, fast-growing startups here in India the other day that actually literally had the same problem where they said, hey, my, the, my master database is getting so big, it's becoming hard to manage or it's becoming costly. So we said, hey, have you looked at a couple of things that you can you know, do to deal with that? Um, so they hadn't, and we started speaking about it. So first of all, what you can do is obviously you can look at uh, read replicas. And, uh, read replicas can obviously you know, take all the reads with asynchronous uh, replication with the master. Um, as soon as auto scaling kicks in uh, in, your, in your web tier and more reads are going to your databases, those can be obviously directed to your read replica. And very often, if you architect it well, that will actually help you to save cost versus increasing the size and scaling out, uh, scaling up versus scaling out on your master. Another thing to do is, is leveraging Elastic Cache, which is our hosted Memcached offering. Um, we see a lot of applications where there's a lot of recurring reads to your database, sometimes up to 70%. So you can actually avoid them actually hitting your database tier by managing them through in-memory cache, which is Elastic Cache. Again, it helps you save costs on your database tier, um, and it works out pretty favorably. Now, final one. 
cost-aware architecting to reduce the cost of your test dev. Uh, we talked about the importance of experimentation. And experimentation only works if you actually have data on your new experiment. So often people want to do A-B testing. Now the cool thing that you can do with AWS is let's say that you've got your entire data center there. In a traditional world, you cannot take a picture or just do copy and paste your entire data center. With AWS, you can actually leverage CloudFront to create templates and stacks and take a snapshot of your entire environment and copy it, boom, just like that, and copy it again, and copy it again, if you want. And in each of those, it could be separate developers trying different things. They know that it exactly is the same as in your, uh, in your production environment, so the chances of that actually working really well are really high. Now, what's really cool is actually an example of, a, of an Indian company that we work with. Um, they have a whole army of developers, and what they do is they come in in the morning, and they get their badge, and they log in from the, in the office to go, to go in. Just like the notification server we saw earlier with uh, the Straits Times and their app, this sends a different notification. It notifies their system to spin up their development environment. So by the time they get to the 10th floor, their development environment is up and running. Right? And as soon as they kind of like log out at the end of the day, boom, it takes away the entire development environment and they stop paying for it. So that helps you save a lot of cost on your test dev, but then also from an A-B testing point of view. So if you think about um, A-B testing, it happens more and more. Uh, often you don't know it, right? Often you think that you all see the same Amazon.com or you see the same Google.com or Facebook or whatever, but many people will see different things because people are trying out things and seeing which one works best. Um, this is a gaming company called Wooga. They have a, an app called Monster World. And it's interesting, you might think that you're all playing the same game, but guess what? One might be playing with a game where the character is actually one eye and more like a pink octopus. Someone else might have a different character. You don't know, you all play the game, but they'll be measuring. Hi. Um, they'll be measuring which of those uh, characters has the best engagement, people like the most, and so on. You can even do it with the more commercial model, so your pricing. It's very hard for a product manager to, de to, de uh, to decide what pricing to do. So what they'll do is they just do A-B testing. It's hard to see, but the pricing that you see on the different ones are actually different. Um, but they can test it out. And on AWS, it's very easy to do that. You might have your initial pricing model on your environment A. Um, again, you see that uh, all the logs are stored in S3. Your new model or your new feature you set up in environment B and you take the logs. And what a lot of people do is they first tell the DNS to point like 1% of the traffic to that environment. They see whether it works better. If it works better, they'll be like, okay, we've now tested it with 1% of our traffic. Let's do maybe 5% or 10% to really have sufficient data to make a call whether this is better. Often what they do is if it's better, they don't immediately swap over everything. They say, let's see whether it actually works at scale as well. We don't want it to break at scale. So they tell the DNS server or the load balancer, um, there's different ways of doing it, but to 0.50% at the new feature. Now they say, okay, A, we know that the feature is better, and B, we know that it works at scale, and now we move everything over. And again, what you can do is then take away the entire environment A, and you're up and running with your new environment. So it's A-B testing, but it also helps you in your rollout. So those are a couple of best practices or techniques that you can think about cost when you're architecting. Let's look at a quick um, summary of that, in a way. If you think about traditional hosting versus, versus AWS, traditional hosting, you might need X number of servers, whatever, 50 servers. You can compare that with 50 servers on EC2, but that's not really a fair comparison. It's not really smart to use AWS purely for hosting. You want to use it because you can take advantage of all these things that we've spoken about right now. You can actually offload to S3 and start caching and reduce the number of servers you need. You can start using auto-scaling. You can do all these things that help you be much more efficient, and that's where your cost benefits will come from, and your increased performance and so on. It's very important to keep that in mind if you start doing comparisons like that. So, we've now talked about cost aware architecting. Let's wrap up with a very, very quick case study of a company called Pinterest. Um, anyone here heard of Pinterest? 
Everyone, great. I'm not surprised because basically um, it is known to be one of the fastest growing companies in the history of the web. I'm not sure if you can see it very well here, but this basically compares the time it's taken to get from 50,000 users to 17 million. It's taken Tumblr 30 months, Twitter 22 months, Facebook 16 months, Pinterest only nine, right? So it's pretty, pretty damn fast. That was February 2012, and with their growth, they've grown their S3 immensely, they've grown their EC2 instances immensely. Um, now we're a year later, or this was in February, um, it wasn't 17 million users, it was almost 50 million users. They just raised an additional $200 million of venture capital. A total that they'd raised is a stunning $338 million. And they were valued at $2.5 billion. Now when you go back to that period um, when they had 17 million users, they had a lot of stuff on AWS. They had 80 million objects stored in S3, they had 150 EC2 instances in their web tier, um, about 90 instances for their in-memory caching, uh, internal purposes, master database, the whole setup on AWS. But where Pinterest is really, really smart is they really understand their traffic patterns. And I think Kingsley spoke about this earlier in terms of the importance of understanding your patterns and leveraging that when you start doing things. So they know that most of the tra traffic happens in the afternoons and in the evenings. They know that there's a significant difference between peaks and off-peak. Then they're like, all right, what can we do on the commercial side of things to reduce our costs? And what can we do on the technical side to reduce our cost? So here's what they did. They obviously set up auto scaling. They did it based on time of day. So again, they switch off about 40% of their instances between peak and off peak. But they also bought reserved instances. Again, it was explained earlier this morning in the plenary session. The base workload that's almost 100% or that's 100% utilized will have heavy reserved instances. The middle. Here they chose for light reserved instances, and only for the peak traffic they, they, they did on demand. Now, what's interesting now is if you, if you turn off 40% of your instances between peak and off-peak, what you actually turn off are your on-demand instances, which are more expensive than your reserved instance um, resources. So what that means is that although they, sh they turn off 40% of their instances, they save 71% overall if you compare peak and off-peak traffic. So I think that is a great, a great example of a company that A, has scaled really quickly, but has done it in a very cost-aware way, leveraging architectural things like auto-scaling, as well as commercial things like reserved instances. Um, so with that, we uh, come to a conclusion of this track. Uh, we've taken you through the entire journey. Um, I've presented a lot of concept to you, and a lot of those have actually been shown in reality live here as a demo. Uh, I hope it was valuable for you guys.